Okay. So that's everyone. It's my pleasure to interview Jeff Watson, who will visit us later this week and the beginning of next week. Um, Jeff also works on uh, probably AGN science, but many, many related things, and we will talk about some of them today. Uh, Jeff is his uh, undergrad in Brighton University in Western Australia, Perth, where he also did his uh, honors in the um, Australian uh, Research um, International Center for Radio Astronomy Research. International Center for Radio Astronomy Research in Australia at the same place. We already uh, you found the radio astronomy at the very top. And then you will stand my first predecessor, by one. Some years prior to me. And since I did this one, I've been in science for some years before I did some research studies. And I'm an assistant professor at the University of the Brains, still working with this uh, And we will talk today about cosmological waters. Yeah. Thanks, Hog Felix. Um, right, nice to be here. You know, wearing a t-shirt in the middle of winter, which is good. Um, much better than Korean winter, which was a uh, minus fifteen degrees or something before I came along. Anyway, so yeah, so um, so talking today about uh, so the the project I'm working on, which is called uh, cosmological quarks. Um, so. Uh, some of my, my main collaborators you might know. So Yanis Liadakis is, uh, is one of my main collaborators and who will be joining you guys here soon. And some of you might know Alex DeWitt, who is uh, now actually the uh, director of radio astronomy in South Africa. Um, so these are some people who are working on this project in, in many ways, and I'll get into it. So um, to start this colloquium, so um, in general, what I have done is I've taken actually an outreach talk that I used to do, and I put it in here because it turns out my astronomer friends really liked it as well. And it sort of cleans in nicely into the actual science that we're trying to do here. So, um, and then once I've done that, I'll introduce the actual uh, observational project that we're doing, um, and which is actually quite a big thing. And if anyone is doing uh, a VLBI, you'll be hopefully uh, interested in these sorts of things. And of course, yeah, so that's unfortunately the Annotation here is blocking the quokka. Um, yeah, it's unfortunate. Yeah, sorry about that. So, you know, so I'm from Western Australia. This is where quokkas are from. So, uh, has anyone actually ever been to Perth? No, if you go to Perth, you can go. There's an island called Rottnest Island, and you can go see them there. Um, and yes, I even have a new force acronym later in the talk, which, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you what this one stands for later, and you can cringe. Um, cool. So, so basically, the the whole project is all about um, measuring distances, right? And so, I usually say that you know, so it sounds like a boring thing, but actually, it's uh, it's very very interesting. Like, so basically, knowing distances means that we turn astronomy into astrophysics in some sense. Right? When you know the distance, you can know how bright something really is, as opposed to how bright something it appears to be. For example, or equivalently sizes. But the trouble is that distances are actually one of the hardest things to actually get in astronomy. So, and a lot of people have put uh, a lot of effort into doing these sorts of things. Um, and of course, I'm sure you're all familiar with probably the most famous person to do measurement, distance measurements is, of course, Edwin Hubble. And we all know what he worked out. We'll get to that. But, um, but ultimately, you know. We talk about redshift, right? And so, so everyone here is astronomers, and uh, you know we. Okay, the video is unavailable. I, I really need to fix this, <laughs> so I, I can do my own impersonation of a of an ambulance. <laughs> so you know it's like dee do dee do dee do 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 do. Yeah, right. That's the sound equivalent of the light being blue shifted or red shifted. So if something's Blue shifted, it's moving towards you. If it's red shifted, it's moving away from you. Um, but of course, you know, what is, you know, I think 
everyone's pretty familiar with this concept, but what does it, what does it actually mean? And what does that have to do with distance? Um, well, okay, we'll get to that. But, but basically the, you know, uh, astronomers very often use redshift as a proxy for distance, right? So very, very, especially if they do extragalactic stuff, your astronomer is going to say something, oh, you know, we see a quasar at redshift 0.5 or redshift three, or, you know, these days with the James Webb Space Telescope, they've detected uh, these galaxies out of redshift you know, 10 or something like this. And the implication here is that it's very, very far away. But, um, but this is only really true if you assume that there actually is a relationship between the redshift and the distance, uh, which is not such an obvious thing to do. Like these days, we just take it for granted. But getting to this point is actually a very, very interesting story that goes back thousands of years. And it connects into uh, something called the, the distance ladder. Um, and uh, basically, each rung of the ladder builds on the previous one. And so a story actually begins uh, with the size of the Earth. And actually, it's very appropriate that I get, get to talk about this one here, finally actually being in Greece, because it was actually the ancient Greeks who worked this out thousands of years ago, and quite impressively as well, you know. So how did the Greeks do it? Well, they knew that the Earth was spherical. You know, they had some, some obvious points, like you know, they'd see a, a ship sailing off in the distance and it was sort of just like go down over the horizon. So that was a pretty obvious point. But they also had some more subtle, uh, subtle reasons to think that the Earth was spherical. So for example, um, the Earth's shadow during a lunar eclipse was always circular. Uh, so a disk would make elliptical shadows. Uh, so they, they even had some more subtle reasons to think. So the Greeks knew that it wasn't a flat Earth, basically. Um, then there was a guy called Eratosthenes uh, in around 200 BCE. Um, and he was somewhat famously was using the, basically knew there was a, a place um, in a place called Cyan, where at a certain time of the year, there was no shadow. And in Alexandria, which is, well, what was it? Some stadia away, at, like, I'm not sure exactly what that is. Uh, there was an angle of 4,400 states. Cool. Um, anyway, point being, with a bit of basic geometry, they worked out that the size of the Earth was about, well, they calculated it to be about 6,800 kilometers, uh, which is not bad, given compared to the modern value of 6,377 kilometers, which is even more impressive given that they didn't even know pi back then. So uh, good work, Aristotle's. But the uh, the cool thing is, once you knew the, the size of the Earth, you could actually work out the distance to the moon, right? Um, so here we actually got the original drawings here. So basically, you know, um, you have a lunar eclipse, and basically, you have to see the shadow going across the Earth. That's what a lunar eclipse actually is. And we knew that a lunar eclipse takes about three hours, something like this. We knew that the moon takes 28 days to orbit the Earth. And just using ratios, we worked out that uh, the, the moon must be about 60 Earth radii away. So it's just a simple matter of 60 times 6,800. Um, and we get about 400,000 kilometers. Not bad for 2,000 years ago. Uh, this is within 6% of the modern value. Um, really, really cool. Uh, very impressive kind of stuff. Um, now, the next thing is, uh, once you know the distance to the moon, in principle at least, you can get the distance to the sun. Now, the distance to the sun is you know, probably the most important measurement in all of astronomy. Um, in fact, it's so important that we call it the astronomical unit. Um, so, like, really, it's incredibly important. And unfortunately, the Greeks got that wrong. And the implications for this are actually quite profound, as it turns out. Um, so, you know, Aristarchus also worked out that we could get a distance to the sun. Um, so, what he did here is he measured the angle between the sun and the moon in the first and the last quarters, like this. And once again, uh, by doing this, you could get a ratio of the distance to the moon relative to the to the sun itself. Now the problem was that I just didn't have very good instruments back then, so they actually really underestimated 
uh, the distance to the sun. They thought it was about 20 times the Earth-Moon distance, when actually it's about 400 times. So they got this wrong, and it, no, it's not the only reason for some of the uh, wrong conclusions we made back then, uh, but certainly one of them. And, uh, you know, uh, this also assumed a heliocentric model of the solar system, which famously for about 2,000 years we uh, thought was not the case, at least in Europe. So, um, nevertheless, I won't go into all the gory details of this, but by about the 17th century, we managed to get distances to the sun. Um, it was actually by, famously by Copernicus, actually probably, uh, well, Copernicus certainly wasn't the first person to think that the, the sun was the center of the solar system. Um, you know, certainly some of the Islamic guys were thinking along those lines as well. But, uh, but nevertheless, Copernicus, Brahe and Kepler um, managed to, actually some, the way you know, Einstein even liked this, uh, Kepler got his distance to Mars by doing parallax to Mars, actually, um, using the Earth. It's pretty cool. And I managed to, managed to triangulate the distance to, to Mars. And then with, with that, you could use Kepler's laws in order to get the distance to the sun. Pretty cool. Uh, these days, we measure just by bouncing radio waves off uh, Venus and other planets and things like this. Um, and this is the actual unit, 149,597,870.7 kilometers is the distance to the sun. Um, now, can anyone guess why the astronomical unit is so important? Yeah, I, I heard something. Parallax, yes, of course. And obviously, this is the next rung on the on the ladder, which is parallax. Um, so I don't think I need to explain parallax to, to you, to you guys, at least I hope not. But the idea, of course, is stick your thumb out, your thumb apparently moves relative to your background by because uh, right, your eyes are in different locations. And we do the same sort of thing except uh, from one side of the sun to the other side. So we have a, a two AU baseline here. And incidentally, this is also why we use parsecs rather than uh, light years and these sorts of distances. Um, interestingly enough, uh, the ancient Greeks uh, knew about this, of course, and that they didn't see parallax, they interpreted as you know, the stars being impossibly far away. Um, and therefore, the Earth must be the center of the solar system. Once again, that's very much oversimplifying what was actually being thought about. But that's the basic thrust of it. It's not entirely wrong. Um, so I'm not going to dwell too much on that. Um, so I'm going to do a little bit of a sort of a sidestep into something known as standard candles. So this is quite a um stand uh, well this is a very easy concept so basically uh if you know how bright something um actually is if you measure its apparent brightness then you can work out how far away it is and equivalently uh you can do the same thing with what we call a standard rod or a standard ruler which is where you say okay we know how big something is and then we measure how apparently big it is and then we can work out distance in this sort of way. Um, this will come important later. Now, uh, because it turns out uh, Cepheid variables, uh, this, is, this is the ones that made Hubble famous. Um, these are a kind of standard candle. All right. So I'm actually skipping over a whole bunch of steps here because there was also uh, the Sprung Russell diagram and uh, like the knowing the CMB and the, the uh, thermal spectra and all these sorts of things are actually important, but life's too short. Um, but for this very abridged version, you've got the Cepheid bills. So basically, they're very bright stars that pulsate in a very predictable way. Um, and we knew that we knew this because we calibrated their uh, the relationship on Cepheid variables with parallax. Right, so the parallax distance has calibrated the Cepheid variables, and we can see these Cepheid variables in other galaxies. Um, and this is exactly what uh, Hubble was doing about a hundred years ago now. And uh, somewhat famously, what uh, Hubble found was that uh, the further away a galaxy was, the uh, the redder they appeared to be. They were 
uh, red shifted um, by looking at the spectra. Um, and uh, so it turns out that he had discovered that the universe was getting bigger and the, uh, but uh, almost as importantly was a guy called Lemaitre, you know, he was a Belgian priest, uh, which I have not got written here, but uh, he understood the implications in the context of general relativity. Um, so this is, so general relativity is a very, very important part of interpreting all of this sort of thing. So the, what I should really stress here is that the, the universe expanding is an interpretation of the redshifts that we observe as a function of the distances, right? Uh, it's probably a good, it's probably a good one, but it is in fact an interpretation of the data. What we, the core thing, what we're actually observing is redshifted galaxies and distances. And from that, we infer that the universe is expanding. So, um, and that was sort of, sort of where we're at. Um, so for a long time, so the, uh, actually the Hubble Space Telescope is called the Hubble Space Telescope because the key science uh, project for the Hubble Space Telescope was actually doing the Cepheid variables, right? Not a lot of people remember that. <laughs> um, and then in the 90s, we got, we, we get the supernova and the, the short version, once again, skipping over all sorts of details, there's a special kind of supernova that has a kind of um, standard explosion, if you like, or standardizable explosion. Um, and it turned out that these these type 1a supernovas uh, appeared to be fainter than we expected. And this is interpreted as being the accelerated expansion of the universe. Of course, they, they got the Nobel Prize for this back in 2011. Um, and you know, this is the dark energy, the cosmological constants. No one really knows exactly what's going on here, uh, which on one sense is kind of frustrating. On the other hand, is kind of interesting, uh, depending on if you're a cup half full or a cup half empty kind of person. Um, I have a cup half full, by the way. Um, so we don't know what it is. We don't really know what's going on. And that's the uh, that's kind of where we are today. And so how do we... So beyond this, well, go to even bigger distances, higher redshifts, and let's see what happens. Um, so really only touching on this, so you guys might know. So the, the expansion rate of the universe today is known as the Hubble constant. And if you measure it directly using uh, like Cepheid variables or something like this, you get a different value than if you infer the Hubble constant from the cosmic microwave background observations, which I've not really mentioned here. So this is a big source of controversy. No one knows really if this is just some systematics in the data or if it's, um, or if it's a real discrepancy. Uh, this is one still unknown right now. Um, we don't know really why the universe is expanding or why it's accelerating, what's causing it. This is a thing. But, and these are all big mysteries, but the, the cool point that I want to impress upon you is that we, all, we know all of these things effectively because we know distances, right? So it's a really important thing to do. Uh, also, yeah, I, I would say that because that's exactly what I want to do. Um, okay, so this is, and this is where the cosmological quarkers come in. I didn't, uh, so there's, there's my quarker. It's cool. Um, I, unfortunately, I didn't, I think I skipped a slide here, so. Quarker stands for quasar observations on the on the KVN from Korea to Australia. And the S originally was Spain, but now it's turned into South Africa, and it might actually be both. So uh, the S is ambiguous, so it's, but it's, it's fun. Uh, but South Africa at this stage. <laughs> um, and so the cool thing about the about this is that it's what we call a, a single rung, or well, maybe 1.5 rung method. So we don't have to go up the distance ladder to get the distances. We can get a direct distance without having to rely um, on Cepheid variables and Kurzweil Russell diagrams and these sort of paradoxes and these sorts of things. Um, I call it 1.5 rung because actually, and this is what I'm working on with a student, is that we can actually use microquasars in the galaxy with paradox distances to sort of uh, like recalibrate our data. But this is a story for another day. Um, the cool thing is, is that we can go from really low redshift, right, basically zero, all the way up to like redshift five or six using the same method. So 
and we've, of course we have our own sort of systematics and issues here, but the important thing from the cosmological perspective is that there are different sets of, of uh, systematics and problems. So once we sort them out, hopefully we can uh, we can do this. And it'll be really, really cool. All right. So open questions, everyone said this is basically saying the same thing, you know, was there really so little dark energy in the early universe? This is sort of the questions. How can we do this? Of course, we want to measure distances versus redshift. So this is kind of the cutting edge at the moment. So type one supernovas. We've also got the baryonic acoustic oscillations, which is kind of like this imprint of the early universe physics on the large scale distribution of the galaxies. Um, I haven't really talked about that. But CMB have also skipped over. I mean, there's a, there's a whole industry around this. Uh, you know, billions of dollars get spent on uh, doing these sorts of things. And the question fundamentally that I want to ask is, you know, does this redshift versus distance relationship really go the same as go to a high redshift? We go beyond redshift two or so, which is the limit of the type one A's. Does the relationship hold up? That's uh, the big question. And of course, we can also do the low redshift stuff and talk about the Hubble constant all at the same time. Um, so, and this is where AGN come in. So I know a lot of people here work on a good friend, the active galactic nuclei. And uh, so AGN are the supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies. Sometimes they produce uh, radio jets that we detect in the VLBI. Um, the details here are not so important, but the, the main thing here is that they're some of the brightest things in the universe. And obviously, astronomers have been wanting to measure distances as uh, using them as a standard candle for a very long time and basically had yeah, not much success. Um, some people have tried, um, and with, yeah, it's an open question, uh, using at least other methods like this. Uh, but we, we can see them at very, very high redshifts. That's why it makes them really, really cool. But the problem is that, you know, they're very, very variable. So it's, it's very difficult to know independently whether or not something is very, very bright and variable um, and far away, also relatively less luminous, but close by uh, due to the nature of these things. They do all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, but as I said, so actually in the last few years, some people have been trying to use them in some, some other methods. So the Tower Tile 2007, actually using radio observations, got some progress. And then somewhat famously, uh, Rizaliti et al, but five years ago now, they're claiming a, a four sigma deviation from the expected lander CDM at the high redshift. So, but this is not exactly, people are still a bit skeptical about this result, uh, um, but we'll see. No. So, but this is using a different method, I think using X-rays, UV luminosities or something like this. Um, but just know that people are thinking about this and not just what I'm up to. Okay, yeah, so here we go. I uh, said so Spain, I should change that to South Africa at some point. Um, or maybe, or saying that I was in Spain yesterday, <laughs> so we might actually well, it might be both, um, because be, then we could be like Caucasus, or which doesn't really have the same <laughs> same ring to it. Anyways, that's what it stands for: cosmological uh, quasar observations on the KVN from Korea to Australia. That's cool. I like it because it's got two nested acronyms. So you got uh, KVN in there, and it's also and KVN stands for Korean VLBI network, and of course V. LBI is itself an acronym. So this is going to confuse everybody. Um, and keeping in the grand traditions of astronomy in making acronyms that are forced and stupid. Um, OK, so anyway, so we, as I said before, one of the problems of using AGN for doing distance measurements is that they're extremely variable. And so the way we're trying to solve this problem is actually by using this variability to our advantage. So um, we have one key assumption, actually, that we're using. And that is that the variability that we see in AGN is reasonably constrained by the speed of light. And so um, okay, this is a fairly strong assumption, I would agree. But if you make this assumption, um, in principle, you can get distances in a relatively simple kind of a way. So how do we do it? Well, it's a bit like this. You can, so basically, what? You, the way you can think about this, we're kind of like timing how long it takes for light to cross the source. Um, so you can sort of, uh, like this, a bit like a light bulb lighting up like this, right? 
So like this, and then you can whoop, time how long it takes for you know the, the light to go across the source like this. Um, and then how you get that time scale is a complicated question, but the, uh, the short version is, is that you type, make that time and you times that by the speed of light, right? The time for light across the source times C, and that gives you a size in meters or something like this, like a, a linear or true size, if you like. And then we measure the apparent size with VLBI, then you get the distance. Like, it's not very complicated. It's like, at least at its core, the core logic of it is not very hard. Um, of course, um, is it actually that these, uh, the speed of light is going on there? And probably actually is the answer. Um, and in fact, the, the bigger problem actually is with the relativistic effects. So the trouble with these, with these quasars is that, or blazars is that they often are traveling at the speed of light and they, which means that the C delta T argument probably is okay, but actually too much so. And in fact, that the, uh, we see, you know, superluminal motions and weird things going on. Making, correcting for this is a tricky problem. Um, but let's uh, put it, okay, so no. Just keep that in mind. Yeah. Yes, I mean, of course, effectively, that's the relativistic effects that we're talking about. So, and then there's geometry, the whole bunch of um, subtle things you have to think about when, when trying to do this. But I would say that if, if you can account for all these sorts of things, then uh, arguably you're doing better than the type 1As. Um, and that's kind of what I'm working on at the moment, but I'll, I'll come to that. Um, so, um, so this is my one side introduction to VLBI. Um, and okay, so in astronomical VLBI, uh, so, so is everyone here familiar with what VLBI actually stands for? Or does anyone not know? I'm not sure. Well, anyway, I'll, I'll give it a quick explanation. Very long baseline interferometry. Uh, so basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to work out where on the sky the radio light is coming from. That's that's the basic idea. And actually, um, and we assume where we know where the stations are and try to work out where something on the sky is coming from. And as I said, this this actually becomes important later, as you'll see. Uh, the further apart your, di your dishes are, um, the uh, more precisely you can know where on the sky you're your radio light is coming from. You can sort of think of it as like taking 1D slices across the source. It's not completely true to say this, but, and then you sort of build up an image like this. That said, it's, uh, it's a bit more complicated. That, that way of thinking about it is ignoring phases. But in effect, what we're doing is we're Fourier transforming the sky to write this distribution short. Um, or rather, we're measuring the, the incomplete Fourier transform of the sky brightness distribution. Um, and then we try to make an image out of that. Uh, point point being is that it's very very high resolution, so we can do better than you know fifty micro arc seconds, um, and I so I get to make a really terrible joke here. Um, so, uh, fifty micro arc seconds is roughly about the size of your of your phone on the moon. So I make a joke about you can resolve the galaxy on the moon because you know, yeah. My sense of humor was surgically removed at birth. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, so, so basically, it's the the highest angular resolution technique that we have available today is using VLBI, which means that we can uh, famously we you can resolve the the photon ring around uh, M87, for example, and uh, it means that we can do the this sort of uh, variability to uh, size measurements. That is the Fokker's project which is cool. Um, so a few years ago, we published a paper. We, uh, we measured the distance to 3C84, which is a famous low redshift uh, radio galaxy. Um, luckily, it might not be true anymore, but back in those days, the Doppler factor was basically one, so we could sort of ignore our projection effects and these sorts of things. Um, we had this big flare with a uh, clearly resolved component. I'll show you it in a second. Um, and even nicely, it has a type 1A in this as well. So we can directly compare against the type 1A supernova. And they have this distance down here. Um, okay, so but this is it. This is actually what we do. So we're quite 
So you have this little blob here. It gets brighter, 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 brighter here. And then it peaks and then fades out like this. Right? And then and so we, we do just measure the brightness and the size as, as a function of the of time. And that's basically it. We fit the, uh, it's just a e-folding time scale here with nothing too complicated. So just assuming that's a uh, exponential flare. Uh, the size we measure is about 0 0.2 milli arc seconds. And you just take the, the ratio and it gives you us a distance of 72 uh, plus or minus 10% or so uh, megaparsecs. Um, okay, and it did, so at a redshift of 0 0.018, this gives us actually an h naught measurement of around 73 plus or minus 10%. What I would say at this point is do not believe this. Um, this is good for saying that we're roughly where we would expect to be, but uh, you know, we have systematics and things we have to deal with um, and whatnot. But what I would say in a colloquium, I would not write in a paper, is that I think it'd be very, very difficult for us to move this down to the 60s. I can think of many, many ways, the way that our systematics go, we could push it up, we could get up to 80 or 90 or something potentially, but it'd be very, very hard to think of systematic ways that would push that down. So I'd say broadly speaking, we are actually higher, we're cons more consistent with the, um, with the local measurements of the Hubble constant. Uh, but as I said, this is, this is a, an unofficial, I can say it now sort of thing was not something I'd write in a paper at this stage. Um, and so we've actually been trying to improve on this. So the idea was that we uh, try to calibrate our systematics on a microquasar with a known parallax distance. And so I have a student, Daehyun Kim, who just finished his master's recently. Um, and unfortunately, with the current archival data, it's not good enough to really constraining this very much, but we're probably going to stick a proposal in and try to do this on Cygnus X3 and hopefully we can get a, uh, we can you know, calibrate our systematic errors. So that's why I call it a 1.5 run uh, method. If we do that, then maybe uh, we can get a, a more precise measurement of the Hubble constant. Um, as I said, uh, unless something is really, really wrong here, I think we, it's going to be very hard to push our distance down but I could see it going up if, potentially. Cool. All right, so as I said, so that's nice down at the low redshift, but the high redshift, what we see as blazars. Um, and uh, in 3C84, we sort of ignored all these relativistic effects, but we have to get the Doppler factor, basically. The Doppler factor is kind of a way that uh, mixes in the viewing angle and the Lorentz factor and all these sorts of complicated things. I won't dwell on this too much, uh, except to say that uh, we need ways to get it. Um, and this sort of connects into these questions about our systematic errors on so And this is like really the, like if you talk to an actual cosmologist about these sorts of things, this is, this is the slide they care about, right? Um, it's talking about systematics. So um, if you have distances versus redshift, and this is with magnitudes because they're silly optical people. Um, and um, so there's two kinds of systematics that we really care about. So we have the uh, what, what I call source-based systematics. So this is something that, like, uh, for example, what if the speed of light, we, we say effectively assume that C is equal to 1 in this, but what if it's actually 0 0.9, right? Uh, that sort of systematic I would call a source-based systematic, because we would not expect that sort of thing to evolve at redshift, right? And this is the sort of thing that we could potentially calibrate using uh, microquasars or maybe these uh, mega mazes or something like this. Um, but uh, the, the bigger problem actually is with the uh, redshift dependent systematics. So if there's, so because, so H naught is so kind of like your Hubble diagram going up or down like this, and your omega m, which is, if you assume the is TDM, um, then omega m is your matter content of the universe. And if the universe is flat, you can also get the uh, omega lambda as well. I won't go into that for now. But that's if basically you're measuring the the curve. That's basically what you're doing, right? And so, um, and then so it's like the wobble like this. 
is kind of what we're trying to measure going up to higher and higher redshifts. Now, if you have redshift dependent systematics, this is going to be a problem. And this is going to be a problem. And an obvious candidate here is, of course, the Doppler factor, right? So um, we can't just stick in a number for the Doppler factor because, uh, you know, as you go to higher redshifts, they tend to be more Doppler boosted because we can actually see them, right? So these these sort of subtle things you have to take into account. There's other things, you know, as you change your observing frequency, you know, things tend to get a bit choppier. You know, there's there's lots of things you you could imagine that could do this. So the Doppler factor itself is not necessarily a problem. It's the whether or not the uh, correction for the Doppler factor evolves with redshifts. This is actually the uh, so having a Doppler factor isn't so much the problem so long as you can correct for it. And so long as that the correction for it doesn't evolve. Um, so, you know, there's uh, lots of things to think about here. But the interesting thing here is that also that if, um, you know, for the source based semantics, in principle, if, if all our sources and flares are statistically independent, we, means we can just average down our errors, um, which is a very, very nice thing. Because type 1A is you have one type 1A. But in Blazards, you can sort of observe them for decades if you want. Cool. Um, so I'm not going to dwell too much on this, but uh, one way we're looking at to do these relativistic corrections is we say that there is a, a maximum intrinsic brightness temperature that these sources can get to. So Yanis Leodakis is basically a big reason why he's one of my main collaborators on this. Um, is that we work quite a lot, lot on this. Uh, basically, we think you know, there's a shocks going down jets, and we think, oh, basically, you see a big, it's kind of like a type 1A in a way. It's like a standardizable explosion or something, and there's a maximum energy density that these things can get to. And if you do this, it's basically just the apparent brightness versus the, the maximum brightness, because it, you know, intensity doesn't change as a function of distance, which is kind of cool. I won't go into all the gory details, but... Um, the if you assume that this TB int value, this uh, maximum intrinsic brightness temperature, does not evolve with redshift, which once again is a bit of an assumption, um, we can play the game and say, all right, um, how well can we get back our cosmological parameters, um, assuming some uncertainty on this on this value? Um, and the short version is, even if we have an order of back, if you give me a billion dollars, please give me a billion dollars. That'd be nice. Um, if you, even with the order of magnitude uncertainty on this TB int value, uh, we can get down to about 4% errors on your omega m. 100% errors if you only give me like $10. So, <laughs> so please give me a billion dollars. Um, but if, but if the uncertainty is closer to something like 25%, uh, even, you know, within with even very limited data, we're getting down to like 20, 10, 10 or 20% error bars, something like this, um, under some very, very naive simplifying assumptions. Um, so cool. Like in principle, we can be pretty competitive with the type one eights if if all these sorts of assumptions check yeah. out ultimately. Um, and then so actually I have a student from a Spanish student, Lorena. Uh, we've been looking at this um, and the I'm go, not going to talk about all these sorts of details here, but it looks like the uncertainty on TB is actually of the order of 15, 20 percent, um, if we assume a cosmology, something like this. But um, so what that means is that we're actually closer to this top panel here, which means that in principle we could be doing uh, like quite precise cosmology actually. Um, in principle, at least. So we'll see. And this is where Cosmological Caucus comes back in, right? So ultimately, this is what we actually want to do. We want to observe quasars. So we want to measure the light curves of as many quasars as we can. And we want to get the highest angular resolution so we can measure the sizes as, as accurately as possible. Um, so we need, And to do this, we require high cadence and high resolution, right? Um, and so we start we're actually doing these observations right now. Um, so this is, uh, we're basically, we've got the KVN, the Korean VLBI network, the Mopra telescope down in Australia, 
this is an 8,000 kilometer baseline. And now we're doing observations with a heart of Bexhoek in South Africa. So that's like a 10,000 kilometer long baseline uh, like this. Um, initially, we're only doing 22 gigahertz, so single frequency observations at the moment. Um, but uh, you know, we're actually doing it. We are doing weekly observations in in a global VLBI mode, right? So, and we're, we're doing it. We're already up to got 15 or so epochs already observed now, and uh, it's as I said, it's quite a big project, and we're really, really doing this. But how did we get here? Well. Glad you asked. Um, geodesic VLBI. I liked, so has anyone here heard of this? One? Yeah, a, few, a few people have heard of geodesy and geodetic VLBI. I like to call it the most important science I've never heard of. Um, so, okay, some people have heard of that. Yeah, I have. Heard. Um, <laughs> so, okay, so in astronomical VLBI, we assume we know where the stations are. We're trying to measure the radio light. In geodetic VLBI, they assume that the background quasars are not moving and try to measure the positions of the stations. Um, now, I threw, I, so the people I'm working with in South Africa are, are geodesists, actually. And I asked them the question, it's like, so, okay, if we stopped doing geodetic VLBI tomorrow, how long until the internet stops working? And they were like, oh, that's a good question. And we reckon somewhere between a few weeks to a few months. But that's how important actually is this, because um, the, for many reasons actually, but the meat ones like timing. Um, so GPS would stop working, but the, the internet itself would stop working within a few months if we stopped doing geodetic VLBI, because ultimately everything is referenced against the background quasars. And so, um, so we want to do geodesy. And or ge geodetic VLBI, there's many different ways. So over here, GNSS, this is um, using uh, the um, uh, GPS satellites and these sorts of things. SLR satellite la laser ranging and uh, Doris, I forget what Doris is. Um, but you know, they're measuring the motions of tectonic plates and these sorts of things. But the VLBI is, is ultimately what connects all of this referenced against the background quasars. And if we stop doing this, like the financial industry, which really, really needs its really precise timing, that would fall apart very, very quickly. Um, it's incredibly important. We need to keep on doing it. Um, that's why also the military gets involved in these sorts of things as well. So it's super duper important. Now, at some point, uh, not too long ago, I was like, eh, okay. So these geodesists, you know, they're sitting around observing lots and lots of quasars all the time, regularly. And this is exactly what I want to do. <laughs> I want to observe lots of quasars regularly. Maybe, uh, maybe we can work together and do both of these things at the same time. And uh, that's exactly what we do. So I, I calling it, well, I was calling it the quark array, but I think I'm gonna, I've got a different one now. Is it? I, <laughs> Um, so, so basically the idea here is that, uh, by combining our observations, we have a win-win project, right? So by working with the geodesists, um, I'm able to get kind of like this billion dollar observations on the cheap in some sense. Um, so, okay, we're not observing thousands of sources at the moment, but in the future, maybe we will. Um, and so talk about Romania in a second. Um, but at the moment we're observing Korea. Mopra, South Africa, Tasmania sometimes joins. Thailand is probably going to be joining um, next year. So Thailand, Chiang Mai is uh, here somewhere. So this will help the UV coverage a lot uh, for these sorts of things. It's going to be an amazing data set and we're going to make it publicly available. So everyone can download the data and, and do what they like with it. I'm very much in favor of open, open data. Cool. So this is this is where we're at right now. So we're actually doing these observations right now. We had a big proposal. So what we're doing is so we have 24 hours every two weeks. And in these two week gaps, we have a five hour quarkers only session. So for the quarkers sources, we're observing 50 odd sources right now. And we're observing them every single week. I mean, there's a little bit of wobbles depending on things. And 
uh, we actually have Mopra, more, more or less automatic. Um, you'll be impressed at how hacky the automatic Mopra is. We literally SSH in and tell it to point to this particular window and click it and put in commands. <laughs> kind of amazing um, how terrible it actually is, but it works. So, ish. And anyway, so we got this accepted. We got surprisingly good response from the referees on this. Like, yeah, great, because famously the geodetic VLBI and astronomy VLBI communities are like water and oil. They work together. But I think everyone's happy to see a sort of combined astronomy geodesy uh, big project uh, happening. Um, so there's 12th, it's up to like 15th now. We should update this slide. So then, okay, so this is where I come into the next step and what I'm thinking about. This is probably where people who have seen my talk already would be uh, excited. So now I have another new forced acronym, which I'm calling the Gamma Ray, like Gamma Array. Um, <laughs> which I'm calling the uh, the Global Geodesy Astronomy Multi-Frequency Monitoring and Rapid Response Array, which is probably not quite as terrible as pockets, but uh, anyway. Uh, so as I said, currently we're doing 24 hours, then five hours, 24 hours, five hours, et cetera, um, like this. Uh, so the idea would be then to go to 24 hours every week, just, just do constantly 24 hours. Every week we're observing uh, global VLBI for 24 hours. And then uh, the quarkers and the geodesy stuff, they would essentially become KSPs on this telescope. right? Um, and so one of the cool things we could do here is where the, the people doing transient science, which uh, I know some people are, like, like John. Uh, so the cool thing is, is that uh, if there is a trigger, for example, like a gravitational wave or a neutrino event or something like this, we can be on-sourced within less than a week in VLBI mode, monitoring weekly. So if we have like a high, highly important trigger like this, we, we can be on source. So this is the rapid response part of this. So you wouldn't really need a, um, like to write DDTs or TOOs or these sorts of things. Um, the point of the array would be to actually be ready for these sorts of things. In addition to the ongoing monitoring projects with Quarkers and Geodesy and these sorts of things. Um, the multi-frequency bit is so uh, I haven't spoken about the KVM. Now this is another big thing. So the KVM uh, for people who know anything about radio telescopes, um, you can usually they observe at a single frequency for some sort of bandwidth. But the K, the Korean VLBI network can observe four frequencies: 22, 43, 86 gigahertz, and also 129 gigahertz at the same time, which is uh, which is really really cool. And it turns out that this technology has been uh, rolled out around the world. So Yebis in Spain already has it. The three Italian telescopes have it now being commissioned. Uh, Effelsberg's going to get it. Um, Mitsuhobe is going to get it. And also Onsula is going to get it. So in Europe, there's going to be a whole bunch of stations getting this. Um, now, I was just down in, South, down in South Africa about a week, a week ago, and I learned that the South Africans are planning to put a... Uh, KVN style triple band receiver on one of the geodesy dishes. Uh, so they're actually quite advanced. So really thinking about this is probably going to be funded. And so um, an interesting thing here, well, once again, working with the geodesists, I found this little figure a while ago. So, the, so Vigos is the geodesy VLBI network. And it turns out that their dishes are actually have quite good surface accuracy. You can do three millimeters on these guys. And also in addition, there's lots of them. There's about you know, 20 or so of these dishes scattered around the world. So I'm like, hmm, it'd be pretty cool if we could put uh, these triple band, KVN style triple band receivers on all the geodesy dishes. Because then suddenly you're going to have a, a global network of triple band capable, maybe even quad for the EHT people. Um, they can get involved in these sorts of things. And then observing every single week, maybe more than that, right? So that's that's the sort of direction I'm heading with uh, with all of these sorts of projects, is that, in effect, you would have a, a global, constantly observing VLBI array. And then the idea also would be that you'd probably have a core network. So at the moment, it's just KVN, Mopper, and Hart, but maybe uh, Yebes or something like this, or one of the Italian telescopes in the north might join. 
and then other telescopes could just join the core on a best um, on a best uh, case basis as they can. Right. Cool. So that's uh, so, th so. This is probably the interesting bit for the people who have seen my talks before, and this is what I'm thinking about. And because we're, we're kind of already doing it, right? Just single frequency. So it's not much of a leap to go to the next step and having the uh, triple band eclipse uh, telescopes in the world joining such a project. And I think once again, I think it's kind of a big win-win. Everyone wins from a kind of from a project like this. And then the well, my final slide here. Um, so uh, after this, I'm going to go to Romania, and I've got the crazy idea to put a, a new telescope there. Um, why? Well, because it's got some uh, kind of useful for UV coverage for the EVN, one of the most eastern geographically countries. Uh, they have high mountains, about 2,000 meters or so, something like this. The, they also have um, vampires, just to warn you. Um, <laughs> so if you if someone you don't like, send them to Romania. Anyway, um, and the thing is, the idea is that we use the development money rather than the science budget for these sorts of things. But the uh, but the thing is, it turns out you know anyone who's done a little bit of uh, development work in telescopes, the telescopes themselves are not that expensive, right? There's like you know ten or twenty million euros or something for a new radio dish. Oh, there's not cheap. But uh, it's really is the roads out to these sorts of places that are expensive. So the telescope might be ten million, but your road to it might be a hundred. You know, this is the kind of uh, thing it might be. Um, but uh, so luckily in Romania they have these high sites, but they've also got infrastructure up there, so they already have the roads. So uh, that's sort of one of the things that's cool about this. And you know, there's active discussion thinking about this. But then maybe there could be a combined sign, so you could do like all the frequencies all the way from low far all the way through to maybe EHT frequencies on one site. Um, and then in addition, you could do also do geodesy and also have things like seismometers and gravimeters. So you can really have all on one site all these different sciences, and they become like a, a node uh, for for everyone. And so you have like sort of like an outrigger site for the VLBI, and then but in addition, you're just doing all these other things. And you know, we relatively uh, inexpensive to do something like this, and I think it would be lots of, once again, like a win-win, where everyone gets something out of these sorts of things. Cool. Uh, how am I going for time? I'm going a little bit over time, and I'm going to put on, this is my conclusions, but I'm going to skip straight past this. I'm going to advertise a cool little result we have, um, which is currently under review. Uh, so is the position angle complete? Side track is the position angle of the parsec, the VLBI parsec scale VLBI jets. Is that correlated with the optical, with the shape of the uh, optical host galaxy in the projection? Right? Does that you understand the question here? It's like a really simple one. So this is this is the idea. So basically, you know, you have an elliptical host galaxy like this. Is the jet direction correlated with the um, with the shape of the optical host galaxy, short version there is yes. Um, so this is it. It's under we've got it under review at the moment, and it turns out that uh, it's weak but significant. There does seem to be indeed a connection between the uh, over three orders of magnitude, um, or even higher if you assume that the the jet direction is connected with the black hole uh, momentum itself, um, and. Yeah, it's a very simple result. We just looked at it over thousands of sources, and we saw a statistical relationship. Um, so here it's a redshift dependency. So as you go to lower redshift, the signal becomes a bit stronger because we can resolve things a bit better. A short version is yes, we do seem to see a connection with um, in, in these uh, the parsec scale radio jets with the optical host projected host shape. Uh, yeah, I'll leave it there because I'm already running over time. So, thanks. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, uh, anyone? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, apart from the uh, Doppler effect, 
the projection of vector and also relation uh, with the size of the plot. No? So uh, we can even assume that there is no vector uh, effect with the projection, but then we don't see the lot. You assume that the size, the angular size of the block is the one that gets the result of the object. Well, what if the, uh, the block is aggregated? That means you're going to have a pyramid. Would you, I mean, um, assuming that they are not spherical, it's a pedastal stuff. Yes. The, there could be, I don't know, systematics uh, in the size, let's say, that the particular direction, in the particular direction of this 1.5. The size that you see, perhaps, and the, the distance that you see. Um, yeah, so it that actually is a good question, and we have thought we have thought about that. Um, so, so quite often, actually, if something is well resolved, we can fit a elliptical Gaussian or something onto it. And so, we've been looking at the the question of whether or not because the, the variability time scale itself is a one dimensional quantity mm -hmm. and effectively a two D Thing we're measuring on the sky. So um, actually with this microquasar stuff, we'd looked started to look at this sort of question. And uh, is it actually closer to something like the minor axis or the major axis of an ellipse? The with the current data we have, we can't really rule out both options, but certainly this seems to be major axis. Uh, seems to be so the variability time scale seems to match with the the largest size of part of the size. But uh, we need to put in some proper observations. The archival data is not really sufficient to strongly say this. Um, so yeah, we're thinking about it and it seems to be that if it's if it actually is a two dimensional save, it's just, just the longer axis is what we care about. Yeah. Yep. So, um, yeah, so I mean, if So, I mean, if the source is unresolved, that sort of thing would pr probably become important. But it's in something like a like an AGN, like shock, something like this. It's sort of hard to imagine too many physical scenarios where you don't really have light coming out of some explosion of a sort, um, especially when you're blasting things in at near the speed of light. Um, but it is an assumption. That's true. Yeah. In this case, just a single, but we actually have some more data now, which I haven't looked at yet. But uh, there is there is more flares inside the same source, um, and exactly, yeah. So we want to look at that, yeah. Yeah. So this is this is like the the key the key reason I want to spend a few million dollars building out these multi frequency receivers exactly to do this. So at the moment, um, yeah, we, in principle we could switch through the frequencies and stuff, but then you at the trade off of less sources. So it's a bit of a. Uh, but yes, we we definitely want to do that. So so you haven't verified you know, the Indeed, the, the very what's the time what's the size of time? So how 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 big is a good question. Um so for example in three C eighty four that I showed that was about uh yeah, I think it's about Six months or something. Um, Six months. Yeah. That, that in this case, yes. Yeah. So it depends on 
dig the source, any source of fix. Um, exactly, but somewhere in the order, and also as you go to far higher frequencies, the things become a bit choppier, so the flares are a bit faster. So it depends, as you say, it depends on the frequency you observe at, and there's lots of subtle effects we have to be careful. Yeah. Yeah, these things are big, right? But yes, you see that this is much, much bigger than the actual uh, black hole itself. Like, so you've got the jet, it sort of goes out for at least a few parsecs or so. I mean, exactly how far away it is from the central engine is a bit of an open question, but um, but in some sense, we don't care as long as we can actually resolve it, right? Um, And you know, once again, we, we can even check that. So we can, you can assume the cosmology, and you can say, okay, how big should it roughly be? But you know, we're not expecting to be you know orders of magnitude away from the. Um, preferably, we'd like to keep it at, at around the beam size, or so, or larger. Um, yeah. But I mean, that's kind of the problem with the current array. It's very limited UV coverage. But when, when Thailand joins, that'll definitely help a lot um, for these sorts of things. The more telescopes join, the better. Now, I didn't mention also is that in addition to the, we're working with the Geodesy people is really nice. In addition to these weekly observations that we're doing, we're also getting monthly imaging observations using the VLBA in the United States. Um, this is the use. United States Naval Observatory observations because they they are very interested in the geodesy stuff. So, but sort of for free, basically for me. And like, yeah, if you want to use the data, go for it. Like, cool, thanks. <laughs> John. Uh, that's a big one. Yes, of course. So you obviously get better resolution as you go to higher frequencies. Um, but also, there's uh, related to the Doppler factor correction. So also, in principle, you can might be able to get the synchrotron self-absorption turnover, which means you can you can do uh, Doppler factor estimates in this way. So really, what you'd want to do is have multiple ways of trying to estimate the Doppler factor, and then hopefully they're all consistent. And, and at the very least, what you can do if you have multiple uh, Doppler factor estimates is that you can see if the correction itself evolves with redshift. So even if so, even if it's wrong, <laughs> as long as it's wrong in the same way, is probably the most important thing. So having two or three different ways, cosmology independent ways of doing the corrections means that we can do the corrections, but we can also simultaneously check for our systematics if we do it, which is kind of the critical point. Yeah. Not very big. Um, so they, uh, I think they're 10, 15 meters, something like that. So the thing about the geodesy dishes is that they move really quickly like this. Yeah. Um, but so I was talking about this with the South Africans and uh, thinking along these lines as well. And what, what we really need, especially in the South, is a big dish. Um, so we, if you have like a big light bucket down in the south somewhere, um, then you, but not at these frequencies. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, even the geodesists are starting to realize that they can't do the centimeter stuff anymore because of the RFI issues. So they move. Um, so really, the even the geodesy people are moving into the um, into the Know, K band and then you know, into the millimeter. And, um, and there's, oh, there's, these KVN things are pretty cool, right? <laughs> and so, so I'm optimistic that we can come up with something that would uh, work for everyone, which is uh, it's kind of the, the, the big point I want for everyone here is like we've worked together and come up with that win win. So,
Um, short answer is good question. I mean, for the so for the sources that were in the current sample, they're kind of well known sources with, um, as far as I understand, uh, well measured spectroscopic redshifts. So in the Geodesy sample, because they have a sample of about a thousand sources that they they go through, and half of them have spectroscopic redshifts. Um, but for the very, very high redshift stuff, yeah, we have to be on a source by source basis, probably have to carefully think about that. Um, especially for BLX, where you can this work if you're running this. So, yeah. Yep. How far in redshift can you go with this? Um, so, in the current sample, the highest redshift source is about 4.3 or something like this. Can, can you put some constraints on the yeah. Oh, because, oh, because not at this stage. Um, <laughs> so I think uh, you know, I think I might have shown a slide here. Yeah, so you can sort of see here. So the, here's our MOM over here. So we can. That's yeah, so that's our sort of MCMC that we fit onto the onto it, and we live in a universe. That's about as much as we can say at this point. <laughs> um, but yeah. Uh, any, any more questions or anyone online? Is there... No, there were. Yeah. Think, uh, yeah, we're running way over time. So, yeah, cool. I was guessing everyone's hungry. Yeah. Possibly hungry. Yeah.